This old-time radio program was originally aired live, long before the advent of high fidelity. As a result, you may detect an occasional surface noise or volume drop due to transmission problems so common to old radio. We hope, however, that any variance in audio quality will not take away from your pleasure in listening to this, one of the all-time favorite shows. All right. Well, Johnny, thank you so much for being on the show. I really, really appreciate it. Hope all has been going well for you. Yes. Yeah. So I wanted to start off. I noticed that um, you have been doing a lot of gardening. So how has that been like a thing that you've been? Because I, I uh, am a big gardener myself. I, you know, do corn and tomatoes, oh, bell, you, you know, all corn, the little basic. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That was an interesting experience for uh, the yeah. landlords when it was getting to be 10 feet tall. But, you know, yeah. it works. It looks nice, though. Yeah, exactly. Well, you've got like eggplants. You've got a I little do. bit of everything. Right now, it's you know, it's the winter garden thing. So, um, yeah, I just I love doing. It. I don't know. I something about it. I find it to be very. Um, uh, I, don't, I mean, people always say it's relaxing. I don't think gardening is all that relaxing, actually. No, it's not at all. Especially I when you're dealing just, with bugs and all that nonsense. Yeah, I just find it to be very stimulating. I guess you could say. I find it to be like, just because you can look at you can look at the garden and it's. Uh, it's always changing, and it's just really fun to see how things change. It's and cathartic. You, it's cathartic too, though, yeah. in a way, you know. But you've got yeah. an, a very elaborate. Like, what what do you have? I mean, this is probably going to be a long list, but what do you have like currently that you could harvest? Well, not a lot. I've been harvesting like the last of the hot peppers, and I have a lot of basil and stuff. It's just, I'm just kind of letting it go to seed now or to flower, you know. Got it. Got it. Uh, did, right. Yeah. Like, did you learn that from your parents, or? No, I don't know. I just kind of got into it. I think I got into it in college, I guess, just growing stuff in pots out on our porch. And then I just, um, I don't know why. I think, you know, I, I kind of got, was really into, um, like, all kinds of, like, sustainability stuff. Maybe, um, like, 10 years ago, I guess. I got into one with my friends, because we were all, like, really very progressive in that sense. Gotcha. We're big Ron Paul supporters at the same time as well. <laughs> that's that's LA so, as it can get, you know. Yeah, so uh, I think it's just extension of that, and I just also found it to be, I don't know. I I, I think I have a green thumb. I don't know why. My mom says that that her mother or her grandmother, I can't remember, was really really amazing in the garden, and I just uh, I I mean it's something. It's weird because I don't know. I don't really think about it a lot, but it's the kind of thing when people ask me questions about their stuff that they're growing. They're doing stuff wrong, and I'm kind of like, how can you not? What's? Why would you think that's okay? That's, you know, that's crazy. Yeah, because my grandma was the same thing. She was huge into it. My mom a little bit, but it just mm -hmm. it's it's like genetic, you know, where it just passes a few, and then all of a sudden you've got the bug. But yeah. Would you do like? So good. Well, would you do like bees? I really want to do like a little beekeeping setup. I think that would be really cool. I think that'd be cool, but at the same time, bees are something where. 
uh, they're like a like, like an active living thing. I just don't think I want to mess with that. It seems to be kind of like a maybe if I had more space, maybe. But it just seems like something where, you know, if if uh, I would want to have to have someone else take care of it if I had to go away for a little gotcha. bit. Just gotcha. Just one of those things where I wouldn't bees falling into disarray would make me feel worse than than I already feel about uh, certain things I've let go because I always have growing too many things i have so many things going at once and only um a half of them are really thriving because it's just you know i i can't spend all my time in the garden i would like yeah. to well do you have like a community garden near your house i used at all? to not no i used to uh the, when i used to live in this place called frog town i had there was yeah, a community yeah. garden there and i hope oh, i actually we actually kind of moved there because of that garden it just started and i was like i helped the woman who ran is a woman named cindy hubach she used to be like a producer for reality shows. She's she's pretty well off, you know. She has like a lot of real estate stuff, but she's like mm-hmm. this. Uh, she's very very generous person, and so she set up this community garden. She basically paid for it all herself, and wow. it's this ama- amazing garden. It's great. It's getting bigger and bigger, and there's all these trees they planted there that now are just they're so big. I remember when we first started it. I would go there almost every Sunday. I'd wake up. I'd make like a. a a huge cup of tea and I make like a, some food and I go over there and I'd work for like, like seven hours sometimes. And That's would awesome. Be like the best. <clears throat> yeah. I, the- I do miss the community garden a lot. The community gardens are pretty damn fun. There's another one that's like it's over by uh, Mar Vista. I feel like it's this really big one that has that all these different trees. You know what I'm talking about? That one's famous. I haven't seen it, but I've heard about it. I've heard it's yeah. uh, one of the best ones in the country, really. Well, I went there. They, you know, maybe a year ago, and they had just started planting the trees and everything. So oh, there was nothing one, quite. Then, yeah, there was nothing yeah. quite growing just yet, but it was, you know, just huge, huge. But it's wonderful to be able to have kids see that and. And be able to participate and see, like you said, like a, what a living ecosystem really is like and, and all the complexities and beauty that comes with it. Yeah, it's cool because it's also really doesn't take that long for stuff to get established and do really well. And it doesn't take much work either. It's just this idea. People, It's like it seems daunting, I think, with people a lot of times. And really, it just takes a little bit of consistency. Right. Well, and that's kind of leads us right into your profession with comedy is that, man, talk about consistency and having to have discipline. That was, you know, I, I wanted to actually have a, have you tell us a little bit about where, I mean, I know people have seen you in a lot of things. You've been pretty much in a gold mine of, of different comedic acts. I hope but so. <laughs> I don't what, know. I mean, right. It's such a perspective thing because I, I can also tell myself like, oh, you're not doing shit. You're terrible. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's such a, it doesn't, no, all that stuff is so so prone to perspective, you know. It's true, but, mm-hmm. but you know, tell us a little bit about who you are and where we've seen you. Well, I'm a comedian. I'm an actor, and uh, I've done um, a bunch of different movies and things in various roles, size roles, usually smaller. Uh, kind of popping in to be a weirdo. Uh, I've done a bunch of TV shows. I did a show that was kind of pretty well known called uh son of zorn it only went for one season but it was kind of a show that was um unique because it was a blend of animation and live action which had never i think never had been done b- before in that way <clears throat> so yeah an amazing idea i mean and, and the the <laughs> yeah. cast that you were working with was so cool yeah it was but, a great uh, cast but i mean we're talking 21 jump street 22 jump street right. this is 40 the ant-man neighbors too i mean you've mm-hmm. been community fresh off the boat superstore there's so many comedic icons and heroes in that short list alone. It's like a dream team, you know, masterclass for any rising comedic talent. So it's yeah. awesome that you've gotten to be a part of that. It, has it been like a, you know, it, it must have been like a learning experience as you as you progress through these ranks. I suppose. I mean, I'm still learning quite a bit because I'm not so I didn't grow up here. So uh, the longer you're in Los Angeles, I think you realize that there's a lot of people who came up in the business and they they don't I wanna I don't want to say they have a leg up. It's just the thing where they they understand it in a way that's different than someone who's coming to understand it in their early twenties. And so there's just certain things that are normal to me now that took me a good ten years to kind of sort of be okay with. And that stuff is that stuff is the uh, the hardest thing to learn because you don't really it's not like a learning. You just have to experience it, you know. It's just this it's a it's a strange it's not a normal world. So not at um, all. Yeah, like you can be really funny and all this stuff, but 
it doesn't really matter because it's not really what you're doing. It's connections. It's all connections. It's connections. It's also how you, it's like a combination of things. It's also like a weird form of persistence and also um, kind of knowing, making sure you keep your voice when you're sort of, uh, when you're in a sea of things where people are asking things of you and you think you have to change yourself to do something when actually it's the opposite. You have to kind of double down and be who you are, but also it's, it's stuff where, you know, you just have to have fun with things. And if you don't have fun, because a lot of people get caught up in trying to do, be successful and do well. And they forget that they have to relax and have fun with the thing. And cause that's how you do well is by just being yourself and really like things. I guess the thing I always think about <clears throat> is people get worried about, I'm sorry. I'm just <clears throat> my clearing my throat. Uh, people always worry about, like being nervous on set or something like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I struggle with it. And I always think about how, uh, I don't know, like you answer the door with your shirt off and you're like kind of nervous. I, this, this happened to me because the first pilot I ever shot, I answered the door with my shirt off and I was like, I was nervous about that because it felt very exposed. But then after I took my shirt off, I was like, well, I, I can't not do this because always people are depending on me to do this. Right, right. And so you, once you just, it's kind of like jumping in a, a pool or something where you just have to kind of jump in. Otherwise, you will. I mean, someone will push you in too. It's like a thing where there's this entire, any film or TV show or something. There's all these people who want you to do well. I've seen people fuck up like repeatedly for like an hour straight, and everyone's frustrated. But it doesn't matter. You're not gonna get fired. It's just more like everyone's. They're gonna do whatever they can to help you do the thing right because it's everyone's depending upon you. I, I mean, I think about like people think about, oh, everyone's counting on me. They are counting on you, but they're also like totally okay with you taking however long you do to get it right because it's just it's just the nature of the beast. It's like you don't have to worry. You can't get it wrong. They won't let you get it wrong. Right, and that and it all kind of is the creative process where they want to get the best version of of you in your performance anyway, and and having a couple failures in that is is going to happen to anyone. Oh yeah, I mean not, it's expected, really. I mean you don't you don't do everything in one take for a reason. So it's a this thing where you just keep you just do it until it's right and it's okay. I, I think that's something I found out early on to help me a lot. It sounds kind of crazy, but sometimes I would do something wrong the first time on purpose because it's easier to get noted if you do it wrong really really wrong because then the person who's telling you like the director or something can really explain what it's what the right is supposed to be because if something is kind of right it's harder to explain what's wrong but if you do something really wrong yeah so if you like really fail or not so much fail if you just try something that's a very clear choice and even if you know like this is not it but if i do this this is more of like an auditioning trick i would do uh if you just do it really really one direction and then they'll look at that and be like, oh, yeah, that's that's definitely not it. It has to be uh, just 100% more energy. And then you do that. And a lot of times, well, as far as auditioning goes, this is like a little trick because you're basically uh, just showing them w- that you can take a note and actually deliver it as opposed to just doing coming in with the one idea and actually and just doing that idea. Or that you're adaptive, really. Yeah, you know that scene in Mulholland Drive where Naomi Watts is being auditioned? I always think about that because, like, she seems like a her character seems like such a like a ditz or something, you know. And then she delivers this performance, and you're like, "Wow!" Because she changed so much, she transformed herself so much from who you thought she was that it's very impressive. Yeah, and you know, Dave David Lynch, man, you got to imagine how many times he's experienced that in person to be able to describe that kind of audition to her, you know, because it was so. Like you said, you could just tap into that and see, yeah, this is really exactly what it's like for an actress that would be emerging and you know what I mean? It was just yeah. uh, such an interesting moment, but gr- going back to what you said, uh, you grew up in Minnesota, right? I grew up in Minnesota. Yeah. So I grew up in Illinois in Chicago. Mm-hmm. So I experienced some of those same weird transitional things when I moved out here. Mm-hmm. Uh, what were, what were some of your first big shocks in the difference just people wise here versus there when you first arrived? I don't know. I mean, I don't think I really had uh, a lot of, Big shocks in that sense. I think I was really, I mean, I've traveled a lot. I've been really lucky to travel a, a whole lot, uh, even when I was really young. So 
have always like got to know like a diverse group of people. I think for me, the thing about LA that was really different was just the, how big the Latino community is here. And I oh, just yeah. didn't, I didn't grow up with anybody who was uh, Latino at all. So I just, I think that's really interesting. I just got, found it very interesting. Also, Armenian people in LA. Like to me, that's what the most interesting stuff is. I don't think, as far as like the mindset goes, I could couldn't really tell the difference. To be honest, it just seems sort of like um, I don't know. Like people, people are just kind of uh, a lot of people are really full of shit. I guess like vapid, also, vapid. I guess I you know? suppose. But also, like people say that a lot, but I, I didn't really notice it. I think the th- first time I really noticed something like that was in acting class, which I didn't take until I was here for a couple years, and I remember just seeing. I guess sort of like the desperation, but not just the desperation, but the sheer unawareness that certain people have about what they're putting out and who they are. That I was like, oh, this is this is what people make fun of. Because gotcha. I I was if you're in like the comedy community, like the one one I was in when I was started, it was very uh, everyone was really hip and really uh, cool and fun. It was like a lot of it wasn't like that side of I didn't see that side of LA at all. I just didn't see it because I wasn't participating in it. So uh, I had like a normal job. I worked for like Fox doing like web dumb bullshit. So it was like a, just having a regular office job. I didn't really noticing that stuff. And it was also like a, this whole like I kind of came from, I guess you could say like a, I don't, I don't want to say punk, but I, I feel like there's some sort of a punk aesthetic because because if you're into I was really into music for a long time played in bands and like if you're into that world then you kind of don't really care about the the statusy stuff it's almost like you look down upon it, like oh look at that idiot with their fucking right. bo- like a boring like oh it's a fifty thousand dollar car but it's boring right it's a facade yeah yeah it's just not my interest i really like I'm, I'm always interested in things that are customized or uh anything that's anything that's customized that someone does on their own I'm like, oh, I like it right away. It's no matter what, even if it is something that's super expensive, if it's something that they have like passion about, then I'm I'm into it. So it's like any of the stuff where it's just like kind of like boring, blank status. And also, we just, I used to live with some guys who I'm still very good friends with, and we just would constantly make fun of uh, everything, <laughs> like everything <laughs> all the time. And so I think that's probably why I didn't really. I mean, it was it didn't hard latch to, on. It didn't latch on to you as hard. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, some of that stuff changes obviously with time because you realize the where it's coming from, but also some of it still also like there's a part of it where I understand the nature of that being like quote unquote. Oh, that's very Hollywood, but also there's a function to that too, and it, sometimes it comes out of just like the sheer like a. Uh, I always think about you know when they show like. Um, like a supercut of someone answering the same answer to a question over and over again. Like when Lady Gaga did that movie, she's answering the same question about Bradley Cooper. Like if you're in a room, there's 99 people and there's one person there who believes in you. That's Bradley. She said it like a hundred times and we made fun of her. And I was thinking about, I made fun of her. I didn't make fun of her publicly. I was like, Oh, that's ridiculous. But I'm like, Oh yeah, this is just, she has to have a talking point when doing these interviews. Otherwise she'll lose her fucking mind because right. You have to interact with all these people who are asking you something personal and you can't give everybody something personal because you just don't have that kind of energy. So you have to just basically say the same thing over and over again. Otherwise, your brain will melt because you're trying to be authentic with everyone and not everyone deserves authenticity. You're like, right. I think that most people don't deserve it, but it's a thing where I got I got, used to get caught up in that shit because I would always want to give people the most – authentic thing i can when i realize oh they don't give a fuck about that at right. all it's death by a thousand cuts kind of yeah thing. but sometimes there is a person who does and you can kind of see it and you're like oh i will engage with this person in a way that is uh really uh vul- not so much vulnerable but just not just not just regurgitating something and it's like um yeah because i guess uh, yeah that makes sense i guess I no know. it totally does but yeah. like when when what was the comedy group that you did you start like at groundlings or anything or was it um... i started at ucb when they first oh, yeah. opened okay uh, okay I used to live the, a the few sunset blocks in there. sunset one or no that this was uh not, this is in 2005 this is the one that opened on franklin when it first opened oh yeah okay yeah i think the first class they offered i think yeah i live and, right uh, next to it okay gotcha. oh yeah um so i would hang out there 
all the time. I would do this. There was a show on Fridays called Not Too Shabby. It was at, it was at midnight or maybe it was at, I don't know. It was a late night show. It was basically an open mic sketch show. And I would do that every week. And we put so much fucking time in doing like a sketch for, you know, sometimes 10, 15 people, sometimes more, but it always be very, very um late night thing. And there's a lot of people who we used to do that with who have now, you know, gone on to do a lot of big things. And, uh, it was just, I think it was that. It was just just the general attitude of wanting to play as much as possible and use the theater because uh, it just was really – I just loved doing that. It was so much fun because to me, when I started doing comedy, um, it just really made me really happy for the first time in my life. Well, I, I kind of did it the wrong way. I first started off doing stand-up at like Burt's Back Room, which when you first start doing it in front of other comedians that are – you know, talented, it's very difficult. You know, it's probably better to do like yeah. a traditional open mic setting. I guess. But... I mean, I didn't do any open mics either. I started oh, doing really? comedy in LA, which is the, looking back on it, it was really, most people don't start doing comedy in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask, is if so, you've done it at all in Minnesota. That's crazy. No, I started here. We would do stand up in like someone's living room, like a bunch of other indie kids from the radio station. I did that like maybe twice. But otherwise, the first time I ever did stand up was uh, at the Belly Room. At the, well, it kind of depends. I guess the first time I ever did it in LA was at this um, this taping for a web talk show at work, and I did warm up, and it was terrible. I bombed super, super hard, and um, it was bad. But I also afterwards I didn't feel terrible. I don't know why I didn't feel terrible, but I just was like a thing where. I just knew that that wasn't. I knew I just had to do it again. I had to. Okay. Right. Yeah, I knew it's part I, of I the was, process, kind of thing. Because there's suppose, like an excitement. There's like a bit of an excitement that you want to do it again, even after you bomb, because you, like you said, you know that you're. It's a path, you know, that you kind of have to take and figure out the wines and the curves. Yeah, I guess that was it. I was also, I don't know what I can't really. I can remember sitting at this restaurant, and on sunset with everybody afterwards and talking about it. And really, like, just being like, man, that sucked. And they were like, yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> but my friend who I worked with, she was dating a comedian at the time. Uh, his name is Peter Sprite. He's an amazing comedian. And he, uh, he took me, he, I went over to his house and he, like, sat down with me. And he looked at my jokes and stuff. And he was asking, had me explain, like, what I think is funny about this stuff. And he helped me cut it down a lot. And he put me up on his show to do, like, five minutes. That's cool. This. And it was, and he taped it for me and we watched the tape back and I had like the great, I was so nervous and I had the, but I had the greatest experience. I fucking like crushed it. I was also just like, you can see my face on this tape where I'm, I'm fully, I do not, I was not prepared for this to go well. <laughs> it was, <laughs> I was very much, uh, even afterwards he told me, he was like, Hey, just so you know, that was a really, really warm room and it's not always going to be that way. And, right, right. That's another misconception. Yeah, but I think I think the combination of bombing before that and then having a really good set uh, afterwards kind of set me up for being, um, I don't know, it just was a good, a great way to get started in stand-up because I was, uh, I was taking improv at the same time, so I was kind of like had my feet in two different worlds. Uh, so yeah. when you did the belly room, was that part of like the, uh, the potluck, the Wednesday potluck pop-ins? No, it was some show that he ran. This was 13 years ago. So oh, okay, I don't even okay, know. Gotcha. This was something, I don't even know what it was. It was a show in the belly room. It was on a weeknight, some kind of a bringer show. Um, and, uh, God, I, I probably couldn't even tell you who I did it with. I don't even remember any of the other people. I remember Aaron Cater hosted. That's the only person I can remember. Aaron was uh, a very sweet guy. He was also, I think, you can see him be very surprised afterwards that I had a good set. I think it's just because <laughs> I, lo I looked so fucking young back then. That I think everyone was just very, like, who the fuck is this kid? And then I would say stuff that I think was uh, a little bit surprising maybe. Well, that's the that's the kind of the catch-22 is that so much of your comedy depends, or, or rather – you're judged so much on your comedy based upon your looks in a, in addition to your material. And it's, it's just a weird du, you know, duplicity kind of thing that, mm -hmm. like you said, if you've got a look where, oh, this guy looks really young and his content's really mature, should we laugh at this? You know, it's just, 
it's weird how that works, but it's just how the brain processes it, I guess. Yeah, I think so much of that stuff, though, too, is just experience. Like, if you can, you can fuck with people's expectations. Also, you can tell people, you can tell people whatever you want. People will, if you have people's attention, you can do, you can have them do whatever you want them to do. Because people, people do whatever you tell them. If you tell yeah. them something's happening, they think it's happening. Like 80% of the people will think it's happening. If you tell them this thing, if they have no reason to believe otherwise, they will think the thing is true. And if people just forget that how much power you have in just saying something. Like you watch like Chris Rock. I watched his latest special. And I, what I couldn't, the thing I took away from it was he, he says something, he'll say something like five times like over and over again throughout a joke. Like, um, you got to be nice to people. You got to be nice to people. You know what? You just got to be nice to people. So I was in this cab, right? And this guy started being mean to me. And I was, he just says, you, you got to be nice to people. He just, he's almost like he's a, he's a preacher. His dad was a preacher, so it makes sense. He does that thing that preachers do where you just, if you say the thing over and over again, then the people... Without almost without even realizing it, they're hearing it as much as much as they do, they are taking away the point of the joke because they've been told that's what the point of the joke is. It's and like a some, mentalist almost. It's a hundred. Know? It's not. It's it's one hundred percent the same thing. But it's all. It's like the same thing where, uh, if someone does a long list, like go up, go down, go left, go right, go in, go up, and then if you do like a long list of things, you'll get an applause break. It doesn't matter if it's not. It, it can be the dumbest shit ever. But you will get an applause break because you're basically just hijacking people's brains by impressing them with a performance. There's all these weird things where, like timing and just, uh, there's so many things that are kind of, I think, certain people have an innate sense of, especially timing, I think, is a, a big one. Also, but so much with timing, I think you have to have a lot of confidence because you have to be able to let things sit. And sometimes when you let stuff sit, if you really are sitting on it and you don't care about the outcome, you can just have this great uh, reaction. And it just, I don't know, man. There's so much stuff that just experience. Like I think about it now, like doing stand-up, I feel sort of like um, you can just get away with it a lot once you realize that you, when you have when you have the confidence of experience, you can do whatever you want because you know there's no one out there who can, there's nothing anyone can do to you except physically hurt you. That's true. And, you know, the uh, timing of what you were saying, Brody Stevens is the one that came to mind when you said that he would just go over, you know, he would give instructions over and over and you wouldn't even know what the hell he was saying. But then it would be done and everyone would be laughing. Yeah, well, he was that he'd always say a uh, agree laugh on cadence alone. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. yeah what are you? It was just a unique perspective, you know? Yeah. But so. This is, you know, being a comedian, you have to deal, like you said, with so much bombing. And this is a, a town, at least in the beginning. And I mean, it really, it happens even when you get further into your career. It's all, it's just going to, it happens at random. Yeah, it always happens. But it should happen. Right. But Los Angeles in and of itself is also a town that's kind of uh, built on rejection, whether you're auditioning for roles or, you know what I mean? Yeah. So how do you personally deal with the stress of, of having to deal with uh, rejection on a, on a consistent basis and also where you have to always be picking the next project to focus on as you're trying, you know, to build your, your trajectory. Uh, a couple of things, I guess, as far as like rejection goes, I think a good way to look at it is it's not rejection. Uh, if you don't get something, you didn't get rejected. You just didn't get chosen because you weren't the right thing because there's so many times, like if I'm writing something, I'm thinking about people, I don't think about someone because, oh, this is the funniest person. I think about someone, oh, this is the right person for this. And it's almost like if you're the right person for the thing, you can't not get it. Right. Because it's like, oh, this is just you. Like there's stuff, there's roles that I've got and um, someone's like, oh, yeah, I was up for that. And I think about it. And like, well, yeah, you made you're up for it, but you was never yours. It was always mine because it's it, once once the person does the role, it's theirs, and it never was anyone else's because that's just the, you make it your own because it is. It's and almost like idea, it was preordained. Yeah, preordained, or just this thing where um, I remember Jeff Garland said some shit about that about auditioning. How it doesn't you can't 
get validation from that because it doesn't. You can have the best audition in the whole fucking world. It doesn't mean you're gonna gonna be the person they choose because it's not about that. It's about the who fits best in this weirdo moving puzzle that they have. A lot of times, it's not based upon. Even more so now, it's not based on talent at all. It's just based on, do you check a box for us? Right, And that's right. why stuff, sometimes stuff sucks because of that reason. There's all kinds of dumb shit. And the fact that, I mean, I, this is stuff I tell myself. That's, that's, that's And it's it's definitely true that whatever you do doesn't really matter. I mean, obviously, you want to do your best and you want to like bring something that's uh, that's really honest and not pandering <clears throat> but if you don't get it you didn't get rejected you just didn't get chosen because it wasn't the right thing but as far as like like also not thinking about it i think for me what helps is to always be working on a personal thing otherwise you are subject to um thinking about that and really you, it's you just shouldn't it's the hardest thing ever but i mean i've struggled with it like hell but you just have to not think about it because it doesn't do anything to think about it. It's just you're just like ruminating on a, a bunch of trash. When really, well, especially if it if yeah. something you were up for gets to be a huge smash success, you know how can you not think about it in that way? You know. Yeah. I also, it probably if you got it, it probably would have been shit. That's why I always think about. It. You know, it's like oh, it it wouldn't have been the thing it was. It would have been well, a different thing. It's a different yeah. universe. Did you so would you say that you struggled with that more like when you were first starting out and first auditioning and getting roles? Was that something that was a, a bigger problem then? No, I think it's become more of a problem and I have to make myself actively um, make sure I'm working on something. I also just forget stuff. When I after I leave audition, I just forget it. I totally like I don't that just I make sure uh, there's a bunch of stuff. I mean, the big thing is you have to, you know, if you're auditioning, you have to make sure that you don't regret what you did and that just becomes you have to have huge balls you have to have the huge balls and have to realize that you know better than they do what is the best version of what you can do and if you can't get to that point where like a lot of times i'll be like they're like that was good i'm like i want to do another one and they're like are you sure i'm like yeah i'm, I'm really sure because i know uh, it takes me a long time to get warmed up some people mm. it doesn't but for me it does, and sometimes I think I might be wasting people's time, but it's also like it's not their time, it's my time, and who gives a fuck? Everyone's tired. Everything takes forever. You might as well do it six times instead of once. I've had auditions where I worked the casting director for a fucking hour for this like wow. six six round callback for this movie, for the Entourage movie, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't get it because I wasn't supposed to be me, man. It was like it was 100% written for someone else, and it's like uh, it was fun to do that, but obviously, that it's there's also this thing where I feel like there's no, you know, what's the saying? There's no no good deed goes unpunished. Right. I, I don't know if that, I'm not sure if I really know what that means correctly, but what I think about is if you work on something like crazy, even if you don't get that thing, all that work you did is not for naught. It's just like this thing where you just did all this stuff. And it's experience. Like I had to audition for this show. Um, I was testing for this TV show. I, the TV show I did last year called I Feel Bad. Yeah. And we did, it was on NBC. And they wanted me to test for two roles, which is unheard of. I've never done. I've never heard of that before. Yeah, it's that funny. would be kind of awkward in a yeah, way. Yeah, it'd be ridiculous. And but I was like, okay, I'll do it. And I I and I worked on this shit like crazy. It was probably like 21 pages total of dialogue between the Oof. two roles. And I worked on it with an acting coach and I went in there and I just really, I just worked it like a motherfucker. And I, um, thought about the, I made it really funny. I found a ways to make all this stuff funny. I worked, uh, my wife, Britt helps me a lot cause she's really good at, she's just like great with this stuff because she has like a real eye for everything and characters. Like if I like, if I bring her something like, I hate this, this is dumb. And she looks at it, it's like, it's actually kind of funny. I could see you doing this. And I'm like, Oh, I guess you're right. And she totally got me to like this role that I thought was so stupid and I also was thinking like, okay, they're testing me for two roles. That means they definitely want me to do this because they wouldn't waste, they wouldn't do that if they didn't want to book me for at least one of them. And I kind of realized I like one of them better, but I still had to do both of them. Um, long story short, I ended up not having to test because of I had I they moved the test day and I was shooting something else in New York oh, at man. the time. Well, I didn't have to test; they just offered it to me. 
Oh, okay, even better. And so, yeah, and so, but I did so much work. I mean, I worked my ass off on this stuff, and I was really ha- excited to test because it was like a thing where, you know, I was ready to to present this stuff. I had worked on so hard, and then when I found out they offered it to me, um, instead of having to test, it was like I had this, this crazy emotional response. I wanted to cry, kind of. I just felt so. It was so much. I've never felt so relieved in my entire life. I just felt so. Um, but also at the same time, I'm kind of like, well, you know, I didn't have to do any of that stuff. But I don't think I would have uh, had been offered that if I hadn't have done. You know what I mean? I mean, it's kind of like you might not have appreciated the role either as much if your wife hadn't, you know, yes. kind of hyped you into it. Yeah, if I hadn't have worked, because that's a big thing about offering that I think is kind of that sucks is when you offer someone something. They don't have to do the work to find the character. And if I hadn't done that work to find the character, I wouldn't have enjoyed playing that character. I love playing this character because it was like this thing where it just was super close to my my normal comedy. So it was really fun to play. I could like be real effortless. I mean, it was almost like this is a dumpy way to thing to say, but almost like jazz, where I'm like really <laughs> bought, kind of behind the beat. You know, I could play with stuff. Where I could really be. Um, just make stuff like a, like a look or a, kind of like a really small things could be big because it was so close to what I do normally that uh, I was just really comfortable. But I wouldn't have found that if I didn't do the work of it. And this is like this thing where, you know, back to what you're asking about auditioning stuff, it's where if you work on it a lot and you don't get it, it's still, you do all this work and you got to you're just you're just that much better now, and also it's a thing where if you can fuck if you crush an audition and don't get it, that casting person is gonna remember you. Right. I mean, especially if you do it where you do it your way, not trying to pander. Uh, it's just it's also so much patience and stuff, and well, and stepping, really just stepping stones for progress, sort of thing. Yeah. There's also that who's this actress? I can't remember her name, but she's on that show, The Good Place, and she's also on Barry. She's I can't remember her name. But I heard her say something. I just listened to public radio. I heard mm. I heard listened to like maybe two minutes. I heard her say something about how um, because they, the person asked her the same question you just asked me about rejection. She was like saying, "I just decide I can't think about it at all. Like not to ever think about the stuff I didn't get because it just doesn't make any sense. It's just a it's like you're torturing yourself. You just have to for, just forget it. You have to totally forget it. And I so I just I forget it. I've been doing that ever since I heard her say that. I'm better about it. Yeah, I think because I feel like with me, it would be the second guessing to be like, oh, shit, should I have done this? Should I have done this instead of that? You know, and that can just eat away at your mind. Oh, yeah, and- it definitely does. But the thing is, it doesn't. I mean, I feel that way now because I had this pitch yesterday where I'm thinking about the same thing. Um, and I was like, it's really bothering me. But at the same time, I have to think about I have to it, think about the same way where I guess it probably wasn't meant to be, or it's like a learning experience to where now I know that how to approach these things better because, uh, it was bad. (laughs) Well, but you know, that's, it's just, it's bound to happen. And who knows that if, you know, the the experience you had with that pitch may lead you to be, to, to make, you know, the, the the perfect example in your next pitch, it it might all be because of that next pitch that you have coming up for all we know. Well, the you know next I mean? pitch, we had a pitch at one, we had a pitch at 3.30, and the pitch at one was not so great. The pitch at 3.30 was one of the best pitches I've ever done in my entire life. Yeah, so see, there you go. the shit out of it. We fucking destroyed those motherfuckers. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's, and that's what where, it's all about, though. Yeah, but the, I, I don't even care if they don't buy it, because, I mean, yeah, we just killed them. So, well, and that's, you know, like, when I saw uh, Bo on Superstore, I like and I had, I had watched Son of Zorn and then when I saw him on Superstore I was like there is no one else that could do this role there really isn't and you know it fits perfectly into what you say because you and you know and, and I don't know how much of that really is your personality but aside from the musician part mm-hmm. but I mean you just are so effortlessly into that character i mean is it is it it's pretty much all uh, written for you do you have a chance to improvise at all no like, it's it's like half and half Okay, okay. Uh, that character, I was basically doing that character before that show. That's why it's worked. Cause it was like a thing where I've been playing like a white rapper dude for years. And mm-hmm. then when I auditioned for, it, I was like, uh, I almost did an audition. I was really close to just, man, like, fuck this. I don't want to do this stupid thing. I was in Dubai. I was like <laughs> this con- on a comedy tour 
doing like weird weird like rugby clubs for expats. Okay. <laughs> and I did it in my hotel room with this Irish comedian named Andrew Ryan, who's like one of the fu- he's so funny. So you can hear this guy like, what a thick Irish accent reading with me. <laughs> oh, Bo, you can't go there. <laughs> so he's reading with me. And it was a thing where I just, I would just fucking around because I didn't know what else to, that's just what I would do as that type of character already. So yeah, that's why, that's why that made sense. Cause it was just, I've already been, I've already, I've already been doing it. So it was yeah, it seems so natural. Had, yeah. And that's the thing where I, even when I record it now, I just, I fuck around so much. That's all I do is fuck around with it. And like say every line a hundred different ways or just try to get everyone on the scene that we need to, to, to break because it bows bows kind of, you know, he's a big character so I can do oh, stuff. Time, other yeah. people can't. I mean, he's big in the sense where he's like, he says kind of ridiculous shit. So I can right. say stuff that other people can't say. Cause I'm not really bound to the same logic. I just, I don't know with that character or anything like that. It's just a matter of um, having fun with it and saying stuff to where you think you maybe shouldn't say, but saying it anyways. Well, how about the, uh, I got to ask, because this is a thing, even in, in our, in my house here with my girlfriend, we're doing the wah, wah, wah. We, yeah. we do that all the fucking time. Ever since we saw that show, that's like our, our new code. And was that something you just had been doing in pre- previous shows? I did it in this animated show called Pickle and Peanut for Disney okay. XD. I did it on that, and that was something where I just came up with it for the character because that character is very similar to Bo. He's like a little rapper character. And that's, Pickle and Peanut is still probably my favorite thing I've ever worked on. The guys who created that show are, I mean, they're like the most humble people ever, but they are the funniest people I've ever met, like in terms of like the writing. It's just stuff. They're so, so creative. Like Joel Trussell is the most, the guy is like criminally uh, underrated and also just underrated. He just like, he doesn't understand just how, just how incredibly unique and creative that show was. It was just like, it was a delight. Every time I would record it, I was, it was, I would never look forward to anything more than recording Pickle and Peanut because it's just so weird and so fun. Disney hated it because it was so weird. Of course. But people, I mean, they buried it a bunch. We did two seasons of it, but. I wonder, well, is I, it on Disney Plus now? It will be eventually. They're okay. they're rolling out stuff slowly because it's there's so much content. It just takes forever to upload it all and everything. But it'll be up there eventually. But that that's where I started doing that sound. Gotcha. Uh, at least that. Well, that. But that came from uh, my girlfriend, Britt. Uh, she played. There's something called CVS Bangers. It's like this guy takes a bunch of soft rock songs and puts like air horns on them and makes it like, you're listening to CVS Bangers. And it's like, um, lady in red, pwah, pwah. <laughs> she, it's like that sort of thing. So I was okay. just imitating that. Ah, That's all okay, it was. Okay. So that was something, again, that your wife kind of brought to your attention in a way? Oh, yeah, totally. It's just, seemed- all, just a hip hop air, air, what do you call it, air horn. It's yeah. funny. I was talking to uh, Tony Cavallero from the Righteous Gemstones, and he was uh-huh. saying the same thing that his wife, uh, Annie, had actually was the one that brought that character to his attention of, of playing Keith. That's and, cool. you know, yeah, and kind of molded that. And it's it's funny how you are lucky because your your wife is incredibly talented. I saw her on her Instagram. She makes these these beautiful like uh, different jewelry and things like that that she creates. Yeah, she's a illustrator and a designer, and she does all this uh, amazing work like with sculptures which well, she started doing sculptures in the last year but she does a lot of uh i mean she makes all kinds of stuff that's all very very visually pleasant and in the same kind of uh she has a definite a definite style very hard line aesthetic what's her social media in case anyone wants to check out her creations and purchase uh, it's sleepy brit dot store is where you can buy all of her stuff and if you can look up sleepy brit on instagram i think right on um, yeah well, I was going to ask if you had to go back in time when you first were getting here to LA and and working at Fox and just starting the process of of uh, being at UCB and doing some shows. If you had to go back to who you you know to face yourself then and give yourself you know one word of wisdom, one one you know bit of advice uh, from what you've learned now versus who you were then, what do you think that would be? 
I guess maybe I would have started taking acting class a few years earlier. Uh, I think I also would tell myself to, um, even when stuff is really good, to still be thinking about what the thing is that I would want to sell that would be my own project. But at the same time, I mean, I say that, but um, I kind of feel like it doesn't matter because you can, like I could say, oh, I should if I had started taking acting class sooner, uh, maybe things would be different, but who knows? Maybe that would have actually been bad because I wouldn't been wouldn't have been ready for the thing. Or also, people say like you know, like uh, when you're like if you're working on a TV show, it takes up a lot of time. A certain, like Son of Zorn was exhausting because I had to it was like every day was a lot of work. Um, but the other shows after that, it's much less work. And I could have been writing during that, but it's 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 the thing that's where it's like, if the weather is good, it's hard to prepare for a storm. And so right. I think that there's that idea where I should have been joyfully preparing for uh, times of for lean times during the feast times, because um, you know you can enjoy only enjoy the fruits of your labor so much. I think that's a, that's the irony of like anything in the creative field where. If you make a bunch of money, it's like, you know, you can do a bunch of stuff with money. It's cool. You can like save it. You can buy a house. You can do like, stuff like that that insulates you against, uh, you know, collapse or whatever. But at the same time, really, the only thing I want to ever do is just be doing creative stuff. And um, unless you find a way to put that money into that, which everyone should do, then you're just gonna get really bored and. You can only vac- you can only go to Hawaii or so much. I mean, some people do really enjoy that, and that's that's great if they really just enjoy working on one thing and making a bunch of money and doing that. That's I think that's totally great. But I think uh, yeah, the idea of 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 uh, working on your own thing joyfully when you don't have a deadline for it is uh, kind of like um, priceless. And so if you to do that if whenever you can. Well, and when you don't also have a whole team of people telling you to change it. Exactly, because that's going to happen anyways. So, and especially if you can make something, like you can write, you write a fucking screenplay or write like a, a pitch for a TV show or anything, that, even if it's stupid and fun, if you do that while you're also working on someone else's bigger thing that's already up and running, then you just have this thing where, because uh, a lot of times what happens is you, oh, you work really hard on this thing and then it doesn't get picked up and so you're you're out of you're out of a job, and you're sitting around and so in that vacuum in that space where you don't have anything to do, it's very hard to to be to generate ideas because you feel like you're up against the clock as opposed to just doing it in a casual way. But right, it's a hamster wheel all of a sudden. Yeah, but at the same time, it's still not. It's just a matter of I think everything's so much about patience, about having patience, and really just. Uh, knowing you're not going to die. And, uh, I don't know. I think it's just about, I mean, I wish I knew exactly, but that's how I feel about it. At least from my personal experience is that I have to take things slow and, uh, know that, that the stuff will work out if you just do it regularly enough and with the right, the right intentions. And that with success comes failure and vice versa. Yeah, it's also, I don't mean, I don't, failure is such a weird thing. Like, I don't even know what that really is, actually, to some extent, because, I mean, there's obvious, there's obvious failures, but, I mean, there's some stuff that seems like it's a failure, isn't a failure, and there's stuff where the greatest success a lot of times just feels boring and dumb. And right. you're like, this sucks. I remember being at the first TV show I was ever actor on, I was so miserable because I just hated. It was so criminally unfunny. I didn't have anything to do. Everyone on the show was were fucking lunatics. Not lunatics. It was just like a lot of drama being drummed up about nothing. Mm. I just was so confused. Like, what the fuck is this? And you're getting paid all this goddamn money. So it's like you can't complain. And and I think I, I, I even did complain a little bit. And it's just I wasn't complaining about having to work. I was complaining about not having to work because it was so yeah, it's a bullshit factor yeah because i did the show the first thing i ever did was this show for mtv called mega drive it was a tra- it was a reality show it wasn't a real it was an unscripted show 
Mm-hmm. And it was like I traveled around the country driving different weird trucks and planes and all kinds of crazy shit. And it was really fun. It was a lot of work. It was so much travel. Oh my God, we had like 16 hour days sometimes. It was just, Oof. it was really a lot of work, but also I put so much of myself into that that it uh, it just felt like I had definitely had PTSD after we finished shooting the show because I just, when you work really hard on something and then you don't have anything to do afterwards, it just, it's, that's the hardest thing of all. And so that, that mentality carried over into when I started getting jobs doing like uh, movies and TV to where I was just, I was so bored. I was like, what, we're not, we're not doing anything. I want to just be, I want to be run me ragged. You know, I want to just be, I want to be uh, exhausted at the end of the day. And so it's, it was hard for me to transition to that. And I think that, uh, yeah. I think so much, you know, like viewers, you know, when we view a project, it just looks like this amazing, incredible time. And people don't realize how much of acting really is just, all right, get ready to sit around. Okay. Now sit around some more. All right. Well, we're, you know, just, it's, it's such a process and such a, uh, and can be such a, a mental drain in a lot of ways, you know, but yeah, it's iron. It's ironic that that's the hardest part, but I, I start, I used to think that was bad and dumb, but now I'm like, Oh, that's just another, that's just part of the, the difficulty of it. And you have to find a way to get through it. Otherwise you're, you're like, you know, you're not doing your job. What do you think is something you need to tell yourself today? Oh, I mean, probably that, um, I need to, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's a tough just, one. I know. Man. Yeah, I guess just to, to relax, but to also just to, to enjoy making things and to, I don't know, man. I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm in it right now. So I don't know. Like just yesterday it was like this real roller coaster and, um, I'm just dealing with that now. I guess I just have to tell myself to, to, uh, enjoy what I'm doing and, make sure that's the the biggest thing because otherwise it becomes you try to create something for the the output and not the uh and see the big picture i guess yeah because everything takes so much time and it's not like a a rush and anytime something is done anything that happens fast is usually shitty yeah unfortunately it's a lot of times but when you do feel yourself like yesterday mm-hmm. spinning out of control a little bit what helps you to get back to your center? Well, I don't know, man. I mean, um, if I could do anything, I would take a fucking machete and destroy someone's house. <laughs> like just to destroy someone's house or like, you know, I don't know, kill a homeless person. Uh, that's, and I'm not actually, I wouldn't actually do that. Obviously, but I mean, there's like, there's so much, so much rage I have sometimes. The amount of rage you... I have sometimes is unbelievable. I feel like I could like destroy an entire, I could destroy this house with my hands. I could short my, like just destroy it. Like, Oh, it'll be great to just destroy something. Like what's, you know, like, like revel in the fucking sheer terror and darkness of the world and just, just share it and create it. Like just fucking be the worst thing you possibly can be. Be a fucking devil, like a demon. Just be go grand around. theft auto all the way. Yes. Go around <laughs> punishing the whole world. You know, that's what I want to do. I want to punish the entire world with my rage. I want to just fucking destroy. I want to tear the roof off your fucking house and hose you down naked with a freezing cold fire <laughs> extinguisher, uh, fire hose. You know, I just had all this incredible misspent rage. And then it's like a thing where that's all just like, what the hell is that? That's just all coming from uh, like lack of control or something like that. And I think the only unspent thing that, energy, you know, yeah. Unspent energy. I have so much energy. Sometimes it's unbelievable. It's like a thing where, I mean, I don't know. I, I can, I've never been tired on a hike in my entire life. Oh, wow. I've, never, all right. I've just been like a thing where all I want, I mean, I'll maybe stop for a minute or two, but I just want to fucking, I just want to go. I want to just fucking keep doing it. Um, so there's that. I mean, it's, I mean, a lot of times I just uh, have to, get really physical like go running or something like that like run, if i go running oh my gosh sometimes if i go run, if i go i'll probably go running right now i'll probably run like five miles or something even though i don't want to i wasn't planning on it like Just a david I, goggins style, style yeah marathon. man i fucking love <laughs> goggins man i love that fucking guy his book is so strange to me because 
I feel like that ending of it is so. It's such an important part of it. It's um, it cannot be overstated. I have. Uh, I need to read it again. Yeah, it's, he's got. I mean, such wisdom, and and it's like yeah. wisdom that anyone can process. But the whole thing about how all of his life he was punishing himself, basically, you mm-hmm. know, when he had that revelation on the bed when he thought he was dying, that to me is the point of the entire book. Was just this thing where he had to. Forg- he was punishing everybody and himself all those years, and he was any any setback he had is because he was just he was in this mentality that he kind of still has in a way, but it's this thing where he's not like a, he's like a Buddha now where he's forgiven himself. He's forgiven those other, other people, but he got there because he was just so angry and so, um, so hurt that he was. And self-destructive in a way, in a weird way. Yeah. Oh yeah. He had to, he had to, he was basically trying to destroy himself and he, and he found out that it, there's no amount you can do until you die basically that will make you feel good about what happened to you as a kid. Right. Cause he got, cause it's, yeah, it was such a terrorist to him. I always think about this guy. There's this Antarctic explorer. He died a few years ago. He's this British guy explorer, like a fucking madman. I think he was kind of a sweetheart and a sort of demure, like opposite of Goggins, not like this, this this uh what do, what do marines call themselves they call themselves like a beast or they call themselves like a i don't know a grunt uh, yeah, yeah a he grunt. was not it was not a grunt but he was his physical stamina was like that and he would do these so he did like a solo expedition across antarctica did it with some other people and he did he kept trying to to up the stakes of it and eventually he did do it he was pushing himself so hard and eventually he died. He killed himself by trying to do this thing. And it's, I was reading this long article about it and you realize this guy was basically just trying to see what it would take to kill himself. Yeah. And where was the it. limit? Yeah. And he fucking did it. He killed himself. He died because his bowel was perforated because of all these, his body was just so encumbered by the elements and all everything he was doing that he, he ended up dying in Argentina in a hospital like a few days afterwards, but it's like this thing where, yeah, like that's what it like to, to, (laughs) you have to fucking kill yourself to find the thing. Yeah. And and with Goggins, it's like, I feel like he, he probably won't do that because he had that experience that maybe this other Antarctic guy I'm talking about didn't have where he realized that all the stuff he's doing is essentially for, because, um, you know, he's, he hasn't forgiven himself for, and those around, he's basically punishing himself and the world because of how he feels about himself because of the way his dad treated him. Right. That's the kind of thing where I feel like, I think I do that a lot to myself because I have, I've always had a bowel disease and having the bowel disease is hard because I lack control and a fundamental aspect of my life that other people have. And not having that control makes me seek it other places that are basically insane. Insanity, like doing stand-up comedy, is essentially ins- it's insane. It's like a thing for no person should do that. Like, oh, it's an insane amount of punishment sometimes, for sure. Yeah, it's a it's a ridiculous thing. Like, oh, I'm going to drive six miles on a on a Wednesday night to do a show in a bar at ten o'clock. I'm exhausted. I've been working writing all day for seven hours. I I want to fall over my face. I'm shitting blood, yet I'm going to go do this. And I do it, and it's great, and it's fun, because it's like, oh, this is a little bit of control, and I get to exercise, and I get some validation, because uh, in my normal life, I don't have that, because um, you know I can't trust my body at all in that sense. So uh, it's like, I feel like there's like a, I have a, I guess is I kind of like Crohn's disease kind of thing. No, I have colitis. I used to have ah. colitis. I had my colon removed though about 12, uh, 15, 20 years ago, I guess. Holy shit. So yeah, I've, I've always had that. And it's always a thing where I've always struggled with it. I think that's why I've always been so gung ho about, it, about uh, creative stuff is because it's like a, a way you can exercise some sort of control in your life because I don't have it otherwise. And, um, Cause I just have pro- problems relaxing because it's like that, that, um, that disease is, uh, is just always there. And so I, I kind of, 
I, I get really tired of, uh, I mean, tired is an understatement by far, but I just get really tired of having to manage it. And but does it drain about, you physically? Like, does it oh, really yeah. deplete your energy on a regular basis? It must. I'm like pretty much always tired. And I always, I feel like shit a lot of the time, but it's Oof. the kind of thing where I'm just used to it. I'm so used to it now. I, right. I'm not, I'm not, I don't look for sympathy about it at all. I really, cause mm. I don't think I deserve it. I don't, and I hate sympathy. I think sympathy is the worst. Sympathy is one of the worst emotions that exists. It's terrible. It's like the dumbest thing ever. Nobody yeah. wants sympathy. There's this great song by this guy, Curly Moore, called Don't Pity Me. And it's by this uh, guy. It's a, it's, talking, it's just about, like, you know, how, like, don't, like, don't pity me. Like, I'm, uh, just the idea of pity and stuff is just It's terrible. inauthentic, for one. I, it's it's just, know. it's just trash. It's all, it's status stuff. It's the idea that. I mean, how dare you pity someone? How dare anyone pity anyone? It's just, it's the grossest, most terrible thing. We should be empathetic to people. We should be compassionate. But pity, pity is just... It's, it's just, dehumanizing in a lot of ways, you know? Yeah, it's also, it also separates yourself from someone. Like, like, feeling bad for a homeless person is absurd. You shouldn't feel bad. I mean, I do feel terrible for homeless people. At the same time, I'm also like, this is just a, a person and, um, like... Th- all you can, all you should do to people is help them. The idea of, I don't know, it's I, I'm getting up in my head here, but stuff. But I guess I just mean that, like, you know, I, I obviously I, I struggle a lot with physical illness, but I don't expect anyone to pity me for that because why? This is just it's just my life, and I it's deal just the cards with it. you were dealt, yeah, yeah, and I I I'm really good at dealing with it, and um, it's just it's just what I do. And uh, it's what I have to deal with. It's never going to go away. It's probably only going to get worse. And so I just have to find ways to live with that. And part of that is making sure I'm like doing things that make me happy creatively because otherwise I'm just like sitting in this world of shit. Right. It takes over. All, yeah, because we're all living in a bunch of shit. We just, some of us don't notice it because we're comforted by things. and We're distracted. Yeah, we're all just very distracted, but I I feel like kind of it's a it's a either it's either do you allow yourself to be distracted or do you invent the in, the distraction? And I I'm a big fan of inventing the distraction because I think that's like I've had a lot of friends who are super creative and I've got to watch them kind of like wither away and it's the hardest thing in the world because like dude, you are so great at this, but you don't have I don't know. I, I guess in a way, having a disease is, for me was like an incredible blessing because it made me, I don't know, it made me just maybe not care about certain stuff as much because um, I felt felt so shitty that I'm like, well, why not just, just say this thing or do this thing because it's not like I can... Um, How much worse can it get? Yeah, or but it's not even like, not even like that because that almost sounds like that's how I would say it as well but it's also a thing where i guess i'm just not really thinking about it i'm not i I never actually thought about that i just like i just like laughing a lot i like being joyful i hate this is a great hank williams jr song where he says um i like um i like feeling happy and i don't like sad and i always think about that it's like yeah that's just how i feel i just don't like being sad i'd rather be happy about something so i don't want to do sad stuff but also well, yeah I just it don't seems like do your it. it seems like your struggles really did allow you to find and tap into your creativity though that's i mean really what it all comes down to is is utilizing creativity as a form of uh, healing in a way oh absolutely yeah because if you're laughing at something you're having, if you're experiencing joy you can't experience pain and the idea that um like pain comes from lack of like, oh, you don't have enough money or any of that, any of that stuff. That, that's like, that's not just, that has nothing to do with it. Like joy is universal. It exists all over the place. Like you could see like, you know, you see like a, like, um, like a dog, like a dog living with a homeless person. That dog could not live with that person, but they fucking love it. Cause they love yeah. this person. And just anything like that, where I'm always like, even when we talked about the beginning, but like uh, like a status car <laughs> versus like a, <laughs> a cool uh, custom car, whatever the thing is that's joyful as opposed to the opposite, 
I'm always I'm always gravitating toward anything that's joyful or passionate, and because it's just when you're in that, you can't think about anything else but but the joy of the experience. And so, if you do, if you're always trying to seek out that feeling, then you're gonna get good at it, and you're gonna and it's gonna have um, benefits, and you're gonna get paid for it, like maybe physically or you know metaphysically. Well, that leads me to my next question, because with the struggles that you've faced through your life, especially with your uh, physical health struggles, what would you say that what are some tips that you would want to pass on to people that are struggling right now that may be struggling through addiction or mental or physical illness that are, you know, in the same sort of situation where they are wrapped up in their thoughts and and they are uh, miserable because they're stuck in the, the pain of what's going on around them. Uh, I think about this this guy, Brent, Brandon or Brendan Burkhart. He's like this motivational speaker. He said some, he posts stuff all the time. It's all really good. He's very, um, he's just great. He's like the one of the best guys out there for that stuff. He had posted something a while ago about there's four things you can do right now to feel better. Uh, I have it in my bathroom. I look at it every time I take sit on the toilet. He <laughs> says, he says one, don't compare. Let me just grab it. It's right here. One, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I got it. Hold on a second. You got it. He says, um, don't compare. I'll just read read what I wrote down. I wrote, I made like a summation of it. He says, uh, number one, don't compare. Am I following my truth? Am I working towards what is important to me? Am I on my own path? Am I doing what makes me feel alive? So a lot of people, if you compare, I mean, comparison is absolutely terrible. We, we're like hardwired to do it. I think it has to do with like a super primitive part of our brain because we compare things in the sense of like, oh, what's the best fruit or what's the best mm-hmm. thing? So it's like a thing where it's like a, the monkey part of our brain compares a lot, but we don't need to compare as much as we do now because we have all these things that keep us alive. So comparison used to be a way to stay alive, but now we have so much we hardwired into it as it fucking destroys us. Right. I hate comparison Especially so much. social media. Oh my God, it's the fucking, it's like a goddamn, it's the worst. And I'm terrible at it. I'm so bad at comparing. It's absolutely terrible, but I, I'm getting, I get better at it if I remind myself not that it doesn't do anything. It's also the idea of like, you know, you can't be someone else. Like I always think about a tree isn't jealous of another tree because it just, it can't be the other tree. It's not possible. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's a big thing. He also says this is the thing that really helps me a lot. He says adopt a learning mindset. Don't identify with progress. Discouragement destroys destroys creativity. Am I learning? Am I testing? What did I learn? Learning equals curiosity equals creativity, which equals motivation. So if you're always learning, you cannot be sad. It's not possible to be sad when you're learning because you can't be that if you can't feel that way when you're learning that's true it's like it's impossible so i always tell myself like oh if i'm if i just try to learn something now like a lot of times i get really depressed when i get nervous Mm -hmm. like this is weird sort of it's not depression it's more like this weird sadness and i forgot oh i've got seven pages of stuff to learn and i'm not doing it because i'm procrastinating once i start learning the lines once i start working on it i totally forget that stuff yeah, it's like one cancels out the other in your brain. Yeah, literally. you can't. You cannot feel sad and anxious if you're working on a thing that you're, and especially if you're anxious about the thing. If you just work on it, you can't be anxious about it. It's just weird shit. And so like, that saves my ass hardcore. Is if I just try to learn stuff instead of thinking about shit. Like, oh, I'm just gonna. That's the, also why I've been doing less gardening because a lot of times I feel like gardening to me, for me, is instead of being like a gift, it's a thing like, oh, I can go out. And I uh, do some uh, activities that don't need my mind that much. Why? Why think about stuff that I that I should uh, be doing instead of thinking? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's one thing to be like, "Oh, I'm thinking on this project. I need to take a quick break so I can go. I'll go do stuff like that." But um, yeah, I think a lot of times there's a lot of things we do that we think are good when actually it's just an occasion for us to 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 ponder and to mull over a thing that does not need pondering or mulling over. 
Anything else? Well, I, know, I yeah. know for me, yeah, for sure. Like what helped me beat addiction in my own life was always be learning. Just always realize that you don't really know much of anything. You know, we're, we're just this little tiny speck spinning oh, yeah. in our solar system. And that, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it all doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is what you can do for yourself today, what you can process and intake and how you can help others with that information. Yeah, it just feels so being curious is just it, nothing feels better than being curious. Uh, the third thing he says is ha confident, happy, future self. What would your confident, happy, future self say to you? So it's like you basically like envisioned your future and you uh, tell yourself like you're basically telling yourself your own advice kind of thing. And I, that helps a lot because I'll, I'll talk to people or uh, someone will tell me about some problem they're having and I'm coaching them. Then I'm like, oh, but I'm fucking – in, up in my head as well what the hell's wrong with me so think about that then also the, the fourth thing he says is to share there's something about i mean that's the hardest one of all i think is sharing that shit with other people oh like huge sharing, yeah so that's the one i kind of have blank on there but i guess i'm doing it now right so basically yeah yeah <laughs> well that's the thing that yeah. i try to do with this show is with, I try to promote creativity because I know, like from what you've just said and what so many other guests have said, is if you can try, if you're in that moment where you're just stuck in your thoughts of whatever, whatever you know, malady may be going on in your life, if you try to just stop for a moment and create something, I actually, I every episode I try to suggest if anyone out there is struggling with, uh, you know, uh, heartache or or mental illness or physical illness or addiction to, as they're listening, stop and even just draw something. And on my website, on uh, sensoryshow.com, you can actually submit your drawings. If you just want to draw out how you feel, let it take a few minutes and, and do something other than sit and stew in your thoughts. Yeah, so, that's you know, a great thing. A lot of people also suggest uh, helping someone else, too. That's like a big one. That's huge. You know, but it's, it's sometimes it's one of those things like you have to put your oxygen mask on first. Before, yeah, totally. You know totally, what I mean? Yeah. But um, the the last thing that I wanted to ask you is one second. If... I have to take care. Of... We're, we're oh, right yeah, back. Yeah, one man. second. Got... Okay. All right, man. Thank you so much again for your time. I know we're kind of going long here. Sorry about that. I gotta go pretty soon. I just have you to... got. It. I just uh, I had one last question for you, and we'll wrap it on up. Mm -hmm. So I I wanted to say, you know, let's assume that there's listeners that that dream of moving to L.A., getting into stand up and acting. Uh, but are holding back because of fear and anxiety, self-doubt, you know, fear of failure type thing, and uh, they aren't making that move yet. What would you suggest? I don't know. Uh, just do it because if you don't, you're going to fucking hate yourself and you're going to die unhappy. I, it's just you'll... I, anytime someone even suggests they want to do stamps, like, just fucking do it. Like, what are you going to do? Like, be... I, I mean, I can't tell you... The, the, one of the, the things that pain me the most... Is people who I've got to watch sort of deteriorate and not do the thing that they want to do. And it's like just like people who are good friends of mine, people who I've grown up with, like seeing them not do the thing you're supposed to do is just insane. Like I, when I first started doing comedy, that's the happiest I've ever been in my entire life. And all because I was like, oh, this finally finally i'm happy for the first time I, i've been happy before but i was ha actually happy for the first time in my entire life at age like 22 or 23 or something cuz you had found really what you're in, what you were meant to be doing really yeah cuz i i was like okay i'm all in i'm doing it i'm going to do this shit because i mean i can't imagine i just don't i don't know i just it seems to me like it would be ludicrous to do something else. And also, it's the kind of thing where, you know, you get what you put into it and you can just be, you can be a motherfucker and just be an unstoppable force who annoys people to death. And yeah. that's the thing yeah. is so many people, so many people like give up on stuff because they, uh, they didn't, someone didn't respond to their email. It's like, yeah, email them six times. Like, right. I don't know. It takes, it takes me forever more and more i forget everything and if someone doesn't remind me constantly i'm not going to do it because i'm too busy i'm not busy i'm just i don't really care about other stuff that's outside of what i want to do because i just what i want to do takes so much time already that i can't 
like it's really hard to do something that's not directly for some, something I'm working on because it's just it's just such a time suck. So unless it's like a thing where like you know, like you 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 pestered me about this, and, <laughs> yeah, and that's great though. If you didn't do it, I wouldn't be here, and that's good though. And a lot of people don't don't do that, and um, you suffer for. It. And I do that a lot too. I I forget to ask to just you know you have to fucking break someone's back. And, it's and okay. a lot of times it's not personal, you know, it's just it's not the at business all of personal. things. It's not all personal. Nothing's really personal. And I just I think it's the same way with if you want to do snap comedy, if you really want to do it, you'll just do it until you die. Because, I mean, I don't know. It's just there's nothing worse in this world than someone who didn't do the thing. There's some great saying. I can't remember who. Um, <laughs> the only thing worse than being. Uh, a failed actor is being a failed accountant. Oh, yeah. So it's like you might as well fail at the thing you want to do. Yeah. Instead of it's... failing, instead of being like, because you're gonna fucking fail at the thing that you're doing instead because you don't really want to do it. Right. Your heart's not in it. Yeah. I don't know. I just all that stuff is just it makes me super angry. Like it's the kind of thing where I just like I want to hit someone in the face. You ever hear of those? Have you heard of those art exhibitions where you get a like a baseball bat and they just set up a bunch of vases and glass? And yeah. It's like you just you go in there and you just do whatever you want. I heard you that. You get too. a half an hour. Yeah. That's not a bad idea, you know. Not a bad. I mean, I I just get angry at people who, like, you just have to have, you have to have confidence in yourself to do your thing. Otherwise, you're just gonna. I think I. I mean, you can even look at it in a, in a Christian perspective. It's like you're you are basically. Um, you should go to hell because you're sinning against God because you've been given a gift and you're not using it. And that, what a sin! Well, there's, not, right. there's no greater sin than 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 um taking something that's. Uh, I mean, it's just also come from the guy who just minutes ago said he wants to destroy everything. But that's <laughs> like, but that that's just like an expression of just the kind of you know the kind of misspent rage. I think a lot of times people. That's an have. emotion. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just it makes me angry when people aren't don't um. But it's like you you get yeah. given a gift, you know, and yeah, it's a sin against yourself if you don't utilize it. Yeah, and everyone has a gift, and sometimes people's gift is not um, doing that creative thing, and that's totally great. And there's also people who are, you know, they're very have a very simple mind, and those people are they're wonderful. There's nothing there's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. I think the only thing that's the only thing that's bad is not doing the thing that you really want to do because you're scared of what other people think. Especially, like, people care way too much about what their fucking parents think, which is insane to me. I guess I had the gift of not giving a fuck about what my parents think because I kind of don't have a lot of respect for, um, to some extent, for my dad because of uh, nothing, nothing crazy, but it's just like a thing where, you know, when something becomes untrue that was true for a long time you're like oh well if that's the case then nothing matters you have to just do what you want to do because you know there's people who do stuff all the time because they feel like they're obligated to because of their parents or because they feel like they should do this thing and it's just insanity this it's it's, i think it's this conformity thing and especially with you having like you said a punk mentality of you know that that kind of mindset where conformity doesn't necessarily lead to anything good in most situations no never but everyone's there's all kinds of punks out there who don't they would never say they're a punk but they're a fucking punk and i just, i love stuff that's punk anything that's like that's pushing or aggressive or unclean or just kind of like i don't know just like the stuff where you're just burn everything down and do it kind of like a rawness is just the best because to me that's that's actually um that's that's what kindness is i think is kindness and um it's like sympathy versus empathy like kindness is doesn't care about how who someone is or what something smells like or how cleanliness and stuff it's about real connection and and love and that that that's what that is and i think there's like a punk aesthetic i think that's that's what uh that's like the true nature of love and joy is that and that's to me what like punk or metal, any anything like that, where you feel like the emotional invigoration of the thing, that is the uh, that's what you strive for. And 
everything else does everything falls away after that because it doesn't matter. And if you if you do the thing you want to do, all the other shit doesn't matter because you can live off nothing if you're happy. Yeah, and you know, there's this Indian proverb that I think of sometimes, and it says, "If you go hunting tigers, be prepared to find one." Yeah, you know what I mean. And that kind of sums a lot of it up. Is that if if you have this dream, if you have this goal, then you better be prepared to what happens if you accomplish it. You know what I mean? Like you better put the work in. You better use the the gifts that you've been given. You better figure out what those gifts are. You know, figure out what your passions are. Because we all have them, and, and sometimes it can be hard to even discover your passions, but you know, tr- at least try by learning as much as you can about different things, and who knows, you might end up wanting to be a, an Egyptologist or you know, the explorer that, that dies in Portugal because you know, they push themselves to the limit climbing Everest. You, know, you, just, you won't know unless you learn these things. Yeah, or even being a fucking, like a, I don't know, fixing refrigerators. Right. <laughs> Yeah, man, there's people that fix, you know, fix, uh, like, basic electronics, fix uh, espresso machines, and they love it. So anything that is your passion, if you can tap into that, then it's it'll just bring a whole new world of joy to you, I think. But the the I wanted to ask, how can we follow you? How can we find out about, you know, your upcoming tour dates, your upcoming shows? Uh, you can find everything. I, I post everything on Instagram and Twitter and some of, on my website, I guess. It's all just Johnny Pemberton. Or, or Instagram is Johnny underscore Pemberton. And uh, my YouTube is youtube.com slash justmynipples. So that's the um, – I post a lot of videos on there too. Right on. So and I'll uh, leave it to you to uh, sign us off. I, I really, really appreciate your time. I cannot thank you enough. If yeah. there's anybody out there that, that is uh, struggling right now, that's listening, that just you know needs a little bit of a – Change in headspace. I'll let you uh, leave us with the positive affirmation of the day. Oh, Take it man. Out of there. A positive affirmation. Man, I don't know. I think it's just about, uh, I always think about shining your light. That always helps me to just think about, you got to shine your light. Um, shine your light for the Jesus. Because that's what this <laughs> little this little, lady, little Latina lady in the subway who used to wear a veil over her face. I think she was probably... Mentally ill, but she sometimes would look at me in the eye and I would have this weird connection. And she'd say, she one time came to me and told me, you need to shine your light for Jesus. And I was like, okay. I was like, I, she's right. You know, you just gotta, if not for Jesus, <laughs> whatever whatever <laughs> Jesus is, whatever right. it is. But, the uh, God of your own understanding. Yeah, otherwise you're going to yeah, shine your light and talk to strangers. And um, yeah. And always, I guess, like you said, always try to be laughing. Always try to be having a smile and enjoying what you're doing. Yeah, if you're me, or maybe if you're like a super serious person, it's okay. You can be the serious guy, and I'll be the not serious guy. <laughs> and they can so. tune into you to get the relief. Sure. So, well, Johnny, thank you so so much. I cannot thank you enough. It's been awesome. Awesome. And uh, can't wait to see what comes up next, man. Thank you so much. Have a good day. <laughs> All right. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.